The last two speakers of this session before the final uh, panel discussion uh, are going to be talking uh, about uh, a wider and fundamental issue, a fundamental word, uh, which is um, in the title of the workshop, which is the issue of democracy and how you govern uh, cities and how you uh, use a system of mobility to ensure a sense of uh, democracy. And we have two, again, rather different perspectives around this subject. The first uh, will be Jerry Frug, who's professor of law at Harvard University, who's had himself in his past uh, uh, direct experience in actually running, managing cities, particularly with the health uh, service here in New York City a number of years ago. Um, he has, uh, in fact, uh, worked alongside the LSE with his group at Harvard uh, in analyzing many of the governance systems in places as different as Mumbai, Istanbul, Sao Paulo, and obviously direct experience of New York and indirectly of London. And he will start off by giving a presentation which really cuts across many of the issues that have been discussed today in terms of what are the issues that uh, need to be engaged with uh, in making decisions about um, a mobility system of a city, uh, who does John Urquhart listen to, both above and below him? We will then, uh, that will then be followed by Diane Sujimura, who's um, responsible for many of the innovative things which have happened uh, at, in Seattle. Uh, Seattle, for those of us uh, in Europe, is one of the shining examples of uh, innovative urban policy, together with Portland, Oregon, and we're extremely interested to hear from you, Diane, uh, how you've been able to get through the system. Uh, nearly the, uh, the, this uh, a very clear system of governance with a series of, in a, in a country which has very clear values, which are pro-car and perhaps even pro-sprawl, with the exception we thought of only New York City, and uh, the lessons from Seattle will be in, important here. So if you join me in uh, welcoming Jerry Fru. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Ricky, and thanks uh, for coming. So the title of this is Designing Mobility for Democracy, but it's not what I want to talk about. I, I, I want to talk about designing democracy for mobility. Uh, I want to talk about designing the governance system, which decides about mobility. That's my topic. And it's a huge topic, and I tend to radically narrow it. I'm only going to talk about one city, which is New York. And I'm only going to talk about one element of New York, which I'll get to, because there's many players in the governance of transportation in New York, because it will lead to my final remark, which will be about financing transportation uh, through the governance system. Now, there are many players in New York, uh, very important being the federal government the city government and the state government. I'm not going to talk about any of them. Uh, the federal government has an, uh, an enormous power over the airports. The Coast Guard is a very important player in the harbor. Environmental regulation of the uh, city through the federal government uh, controls an enormous amount of project. Any transportation project will be, have to comply with federal law. The city, as John's talk demonstrated, is a very important player uh, in terms of the bikes and the use of the buses. A lot of innovations happening at the city level. In many ways, the state is the most important player of all of them uh, here in, in New York. Uh, much of what the city does is subject to state control and subject to state direction. Uh, the most famous moment but most recently is when the governor of New Jersey canceled the rail uh, tunnel that was supposed to connect uh, New Jersey and New York. This is the governor acting. This is the state power. So I want to simply acknowledge that there are many important actors of which the federal, state, and city government uh, are, are examples, but I'm not going to talk about them. What I'm going to talk about is the way in which much of the governance system is run by boards of directors. And boards of directors, first of all, by, of public authorities. And I'm trying to figure out who these people are and why is it we want them to make transportation decisions. Now, 
the, who, who are we talking about? So the Metropolitan Transportation Authority uh, runs the subways and buses. Uh, it runs the uh, Long Island Railroad, the Triborough Bridge, uh, Queens Midtown Tunnel. Uh, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey runs the uh, Holland and Lincoln Tunnel to George Washington Bridge, the PATH trains to New Jersey. Amtrak runs a big commuter connection, which is not the Long Island Railroad, not run by the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And then New Jersey Transit, uh, which uh, claims it's the third largest bus and rail system in the nation runs a lot of the commuting uh, from New Jersey uh, into New York. So who are these people? So let's try to figure out who are making the decisions about uh, the bridges, tunnels, subways, airports. I, I didn't mention that the Port Authority controls the airports. So Metropolitan Transportation Authority is has run by a board of directors of 17 people. Four are recommended by the mayor of the city of New York. Six are appointed by the governor uh, without any recommendation. And seven are appointed by, uh, are, are based on a recommendation of counties uh, in New York State surrounding, uh, surrounding the city, except that the seven only have four votes. Four of the counties are linked together. If you're not following that, this, that's the point. Uh, the point is, there's this very complicated organization which is not really representative of the city. So the, the mayor recommends four people to the governor, but the governor appoints them. When the, when the counties recommend, they send a list of three people, and the governor appoints one of them. And then the governor appoints other people too. So it's a kind of an odd idea of what it would mean to have local participation in transportation decisions made by a board of directors. Uh, so the other thing is, if you take the seven counties that have these four votes, that's five million people. New York has eight million people. And they have the same number of votes. And if you're trying to think about organizing a responsive to the locality's idea, to have four votes for five million, four votes for eight million is, one way to put it, is undemocratic. Uh, if this was an elected system, it would be unconstitutional in the United States. You can't organize an elected government system in which five million people have the same amount of say as eight million people. The last thing I want to say about the Metropolitan Transportation Authority is that it lists the kinds of people who, in the statute, in the statute, lists the kind of people who should be on the board, the, the expertise. I'm going to read you the list, and I want you to tell me you think of anything's missing. These are the, this, is, this is the list from the statute, the kinds of area expertise who would be appointed to the board. Transportation, public administration, business management, finance, accounting, law, engineering, land use, urban and regional planning, management of large capital projects, projects, and labor relations. Anybody not there? So you might think, how about users of the system? How about people interested in environmental justice? How about designers? Sociologists, I mean, so they have a particular idea of who should be on the board and what this system is. Okay, now, the New Jersey Transit, New Jersey Transit has a seven-person board, all appointed by the governor, no local participation of any kind. Uh, what's more, if the, the governor doesn't like what New Jersey Transit does, he can overrule them. So you kind of wonder, why would you appoint a board of seven people when you could just be overruled if they don't like your decision? Why would we have the board of all? There's also no expertise list of any kind on this. 
The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey has 12 people on a board, six appointed by the governor of New York, six appointed by the governor of New Jersey. Again, no expertise list. Again, the governor can overrule the people from their own state. Again, no idea of local representation of any kind. All right. Uh, and then there's Amtrak, appointed by the President of the United States, subject to the confirmation of the Senate. Very important player in the transportation network of the city of New York. Obviously, no local representation uh, 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 of any kind. All right. So, in addition to these agencies that run the subways, manage the airports, run the bridges and tunnels, not all the bridges and tunnels are run by the city, we have this idea of metropolitan planning organizations. Uh, since the 70s, the federal government has required regional metropolitan uh, planning as part of the federal government's program uh, for thinking about transportation. In New York, there are three metropolitan trans transportation organizations, not one. Uh, one is New York and some of the surrounding counties, not the same area as the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, it's smaller. It's made up, uh, the chairman of that is a state official. There are two city officials on it, the transportation commissioners and the, and the city planning uh, commissioner, uh, and uh, five county executives. So it's some officials, some elected people like the county executives, but again, we have very different ideas. So Putnam County, one of the counties, has 100,000 people. New York has 8 million, and they're both on the board. Right. Now, the Connecticut part of the metropolitan area has a metropolitan planning area, Unlike the New York one, the county is not there at all. The people who are on that board are six elected officials. Uh, eight, actually. Eight elected officials from the towns. So here we have the idea being the cities and not the county. Whereas in New York, we have the idea of the county, not the city, as being representative. Uh, it has to be said that in Connecticut, suburban Connecticut, there are more than eight cities and towns. So we've selected some cities and towns to be the elected officials who are on the planning. And again, they vary in population from 10,000 to 120,000, each with one vote. Uh, and finally, well, there's the New, New Jersey planning uh, organization, which has uh, a board of directors, which made up of all the county officials, 13 county officials, uh, and Newark and Jersey City two cities, some county officials, and then a bunch of governor people. Now, you had enough, you should have enough. You don't want to hear anymore. Here's the basic, here's the basic question about of all this. How do we understand who these people are? What kind of people should there be? First question, when we have decision makers in very powerful positions, making transportation policy, uncoordinated with each other. The transportation, uh, the MTA, the Port Authority, uh, Amtrak, New Jersey Transit, they're not all connected to each other. When they're each making policy, should there be local, local participation in these decisions? The answer in New Jersey Transit and the Port Authority and Amtrak is no. The answer is no. The MTA has this somewhat odd idea of participation in which there's a recommended to the governor but not officials. And then you look at the planning agencies and you think, well, the local transportation, uh, what are local? What would be the local input? And it varies from the counties to the cities, or some cities and some counties and some state officials. Uh, so the first question is, what is the role of local participation in governance decisions of these boards of directors? Very answers here, right? Uh, and then the question would be, what kind of expertise do we want on these boards? I've read to you the, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority has a list of expertise that no one else does. No one else does. 
Is there some, we, we, we like to think of these, these independent agencies like this as being made up of experts, but they could also be made up of cronies. And you kind of wonder, who is it that gets appointed to these things and to what extent uh, do we trust them as having knowledge? Uh, and then the last point, but the one I've been emphasizing really is, to what extent, when we organize these things, should there be actual democratic organization in which equal number of people have an equal say in the, in the decision-making process? Uh, in none of these agencies, in none of these agencies is New York City adequately represented. New York City is either not invited at all, or in the Metropolitan Planning Agency or in the MTA, even if you count it as representation, it's underrepresented. But in none of these cities are other people represented from a local point of view. So a very basic question is, to what extent do we want decision making to be made about the locality without local representation, and to the extent when we organize local representation, do we want it to be along a one-person, uh, one-vote line? Now, it has to be said there are a lot of other ideas about how, how to organize these, these, these things. So the, the uh, Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority the, runs the subways in, uh, in uh, Boston, has been put under the State Department of Transportation. This still has a board but it's now under the state in a way that these other agencies uh, are not. The Bay Area Rapid Transit has an elected board of directors. An elected board of directors, one person, one vote, through the, uh, through the area in which the Bay Area Transit works. Uh, I think in a governance system, we need to think about organization and representation. Uh, so I mean, my own view is some basic propositions. One, I think there needs to be a local voice in every transportation decision. Uh, two, I think the local voices should be proportionate to the people being influenced. Three, I think that the region is the right way to think about these things, which means not the state. The state of New Jersey goes you know, a long way down. There's Philadelphia and beyond, right? So Camden, I should say. So uh, we, we want to think the region. We want to think about all these disparate organizations. And we want to think about uh, their organization. Why? One reason is to be responsive, just as a matter of policy, to be responsive, democratic. This is designing democracy for mobility. If we think about this idea as a democratic responsibility, we, we need to have a legitimately democratic organizational structure that makes these basic policy decisions. But there's another reason, too, which is the last point I'm trying to emphasize, which is finance. You cannot run a transportation system uh, based on the fares and state aid, which is basically what we try to do. That the fares do not cover enough, and state aid, as we know, gets cut. And so the transportation system in New York and everywhere is subject to a fall off of revenue at every moment because it has no stable source of revenue other than you know, fares, which have a limit, uh, and state aid, which is instable. So what to do? So what one needs is another source of income allocated to the transportation system. There have been various ways in which this has been thought about. The congestion charging was one of these ways in which the money from congestion charging uh, would go into the transportation network, or at least in part of it. When Richard Ravitch, who was the chairman of the uh, MTA and lieutenant governor, came up with this plan, he thought that the idea was 
a wage tax, a third percent wage tax on people within the region plus uh, tolls on the city bridges that, are, that have no tolls. The Bay Area Rapid Transit has a funding source of a half a percent of a sales tax in the region. The point about these taxes is that if you have a half a percent of the sales tax or if you have a wage tax, uh, these are not dependent on, on annual decisions of the state government for aid. And they're not dependent on the fare box. It's another stable source of income. So the question is, uh, how could we even begin to think about creating a stable source of income for the transportation network of New York? The, the model here, of course, is the Highway Trust Fund. The Highway Trust Fund, based upon taxes on gasoline, is a stable, roughly, source of income for highways, which we just don't have as a comparable thing. Uh, how, how could we organize this politically? Well, it seems to me you can't have a, a uh, finance system based upon some regional tax without a regional institution in which we can have confidence that the finance system is based upon the organizational system and the organizational system based on the finance system. The money has to go to a democratically responsive uh, entity, which could then allocate the money in a way. And the way these boards are now organized, it's much harder to defend uh, a finance system that, that could support them. So both for uh, democratic reasons and for financial reasons, uh, I think we need to focus on these kind of the detailed nature of the, of the governance system. The thing about this, this is the final word, the thing about this governance system is this story could be told about every city I've ever been to. That every city has some form of some complicated interlocking governance system. And it's true, transport for London is a, is a uh, major advance, but they have a board too. And why do they have a board chaired by the mayor? What, what's this board? What is the idea? Who are these people and what kind of influence do we want them to have, even in, the, in a system in which the mayor has a lot of, uh, a lot of say? Okay, thank you. Okay, I can almost see some of you over there. <laughs> can I do this? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I thought we had a complex kind of governance system, but now I feel so much better about things in Seattle. <laughs> um, just a little background in terms of what I'm going to try to cover today. Um, quickly to talk a little bit about the city and our core values, what type of city we're trying to create um, what we are doing to achieve those values and then try to tie in the, the emphasis in terms of mobility and impacts and where, where we're maybe doing fairly well and other places where uh, we're perhaps being a little challenged. Um, we are the evergreen state. Washington is the evergreen state. Seattle is known as the Emerald City. Um, we are a city surrounded by water mountains for us. Um, strong environmental ethic, I think, is something that we're often thought of um, in terms of the city of Seattle. Um, so what are we trying to create? We're trying to have a city that, where people of all lifestyles, all incomes, all interests will feel welcome. Uh, a little bit of a challenge. Some of the things that we're looking at, though, and you'll hear a fairly common theme in terms of things like housing, transportation, jobs, how those all um, are interconnected in our mind. Looking at housing and housing options, where people can live in the type of um, housing and affordability. Um, transportation choices. Uh, so one of the things that we hear is bus system. Our, our bus system actually works fairly well, but there's a sense that the bus is for people who can't afford to drive a car. And so there's kind of a negative um, uh, 
I drive the bus, but it's okay. Uh, there's kind of a negative attached to it. Um, bicycles, it is for the people who put their spandex on, who put their fancy bicycle outfits on and zip downtown. It's not for the average uh, person um, is kind of the thinking. We have a ferry system. We have um, a water taxi. We finally have a um, light rail system. The citizens in the area turned it down a couple times since the late 60s. We could have had a light rail system much earlier, but we finally got one that started, I think it opened in 2009. And we now have a streetcar system. Again, it only opened in 2009, and it's a fairly limited route, but we are looking at expanding that route. Right now, the light rail system, which was half funded by um, local improvement districts, so the property owners in the area that would benefit, paid for half of the cost of that system. This is a light rail system, I mean a streetcar system though, that goes to a new part of town north of the city, our biotech, um, global health area. Um, it's where Amazon has opened its headquarters in seven buildings, they're so large. Um, it's where the Gates Foundation, the largest philanthropic organization in the world, has its headquarters. So it's not just your regular type of community, it's a new growing community. Um, oh, one other thing about transportation, they are for the most part separate systems, so we're really working on trying to integrate the systems. It took us a long time to get a smart card so you could use the same card for bus and streetcar, but it doesn't work on everything. Um, economic development, um, I was talking earlier with somebody in terms of we're no longer dependent on Boeing, um, but, and we are more diversified now, it's something that we need to keep working at to make sure we have a range of jobs in the city. We don't, uh, we want to keep our industrial areas, we want to keep uh, manufacturing, as well as promoting biotech, global health, those kinds of things. Um, family friendly, uh, we used to be the number two city below San Francisco in terms of the lowest number of children um, in the city. And, um, the good news is, is that the last 10 years with the census shows that we are increasing um, with children more, um, a, more, a, a greater percentage than our overall population growth. Parks and open space are important in terms of as we try to create density, uh, making sure that we have parks and open space for people, particularly if they don't live in the single family areas with, that are surrounded by yards. Culture and arts, uh, an important, another important aspect for the city, um, building on our past historic heritage as well as looking at the, the new populations that are coming in and being a part of the city. And then sustainability in terms of our buildings, how we design our sites, our transportation systems, sustainable infrastructure is so what we're working on in terms of interagency um, 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 projects. So, Becoming the city we want to be. In the early 50s, as other jurisdictions have done, we built transportation systems. We built a two-deck viaduct that cut off our downtown from our waterfront. Hopefully, we'll get that taken care of in the next few years. We're doing the waterfront planning now um, with James Corner, actually, as the designer. Um, we also had the Interstate 5 that cut through communities, and we've seen this in, in apparently around the world as well as other uh, municipalities in the uh, states. Um, they cut through poor neighborhoods, cut them in half, um, kind of destroyed communities. So that was the kind of the bad news, and I had already mentioned we turned down the um, light rail system in the, in the late 60s. The good news was is that there were some people thinking statewide in terms of something needed to be done. We were, um, people were going further and further out, developing, you know, the sprawl, developing further and further out. We were losing our forests. We were losing our farmlands. Our vehicle miles traveled were increasing way more than the population was increasing. And so the good news is, is that in 1990, the state passed a Growth Management Act and basically said that cities of 20,000 or more needed to develop a comprehensive plan that was consistent with the State Growth Management Act. Um, it also said that your regulations need to be consistent with your comprehensive plan. Um, Seattle's core values, environmental stewardship, economic opportunity, community, and social equity. That was in 1994, so I think we were actually 
doing pretty well in terms of looking at where we needed to be and the type of plan we needed. Um, so Seattle's plan was called Toward a Sustainable Seattle. Um, I should mention also that the State Growth Management Act set urban growth boundaries. So development was supposed to primarily happen within the urban growth boundary. Seattle is entirely within an urban growth boundary. Um, Seattle's plan is based on an urban village strategy. Uh, the green areas are, are urban villages, and then the ones that are a little darker with the crosshatch are what we call our urban centers. And so we have six urban centers. Four of them are downtown, and then the University District and Northgate. The urban center is where the majority of our residential and employment growth is expected to uh, take place. And then the urban villages are more like our neighborhood commercial areas where we will have more density in terms of um, multifamily kind of uh, development and places where people can walk to their, hopefully, their grocery stores and their shopping and their services. Um, so the, the concept was built on existing infrastructure, um, densities, and where we're putting our public transportation investment. What you can see is, hopefully you can kind of see the outline of the city, is you'll see that there's a lot of area that actually um, are not in our urban centers and villages, and I'll talk about that a little later. We had, a, the good news I guess was we had a very popular mayor in office at the time, it was still very controversial because people felt we were going to totally change their neighborhood. And change is something that's hard to take. It really wasn't that significant a change, but that's what they feared because we called it urban villages and we hadn't called it that before. Um, so getting the plan, the comprehensive plan adopted, getting it through council, uh, one of the things that the city committed to do is to do neighborhood plans. Neighborhoods were given money by the city to either hire their own planners to do, and consultants to do the work or city staff would work with them and it worked both ways. Um, so they could do their neighborhood plans. 38 neighborhood plans were completed in about four years in the late 90s. Um, since then, we've also developed design guidelines. So we have a design review process for projects over a certain size and so um, there are citywide design guidelines and there are neighborhood design guidelines. Um, so that was kind of to appease people in terms of accepting the concept of the comprehensive plan. So some of the challenges that we face. I mentioned it's hard to accept change. Um, our former mayor used to like to say, we hate sprawl, but we despise density. Um, we have strong um, single family home ownership in terms of the comprehensive plan basically says thou shalt not rezone hardly any single family to something more intense. Um, and so how do we provide housing choices and get to affordability when we've got those limitations? More than 60% of the city is zoned single family and you look at the map and the yellow areas are zoned single family. Yet, more than 50% more than 50 of our population are renters now, much higher than most people had anticipated. Um, who was involved in the neighborhood planning work? Primarily white homeowners. And we looked at, and it, it wasn't so obvious at the time, but as we look back on it now, and the city has changed, um, that's primarily the people who turned out for those planning meetings. The whole issue of rail. Um, and I'll talk a little more about our, our, our stationary planning in a bit, but uh, controversy. Which neighborhoods got the surface rail? Which neighborhoods got the underground rail? Um, and then the whole thing about Seattle, the state is kind of known for a strong environmental ethic, but don't tell me I shouldn't drive my car. Um, that's, that's kind of what we're struggling with. Um, in terms of kind of the, the general reaction we, we get from people. The other thing is that Seattle is changing significantly, particularly over the past 10 years. Um, we have, in the southeast part of Seattle where we're doing the, the light rail planning, um, more than 50% of the people were not born in the United States. And so we need to work very differently with our communities as we do uh, planning. Some of the things we've learned from them, and we, 
We have outreach people um, who can speak the language and we might have a public meeting where there's eight different languages, simultaneous translations going on in eight different languages. And we've heard from people. Um, we were at a senior um, housing development, uh, about a 12-story uh, senior housing project. And uh, many of them are, are Chinese, elderly Chinese. And you know, they didn't care about height. They live in a 12-story building. They came from China where there's tall buildings. What they wanted was an open space around their building so they could do their Tai Chi in the morning. And we also had people who said, I've never been asked what I want in my neighborhood. Um, we also um, talked with people. We have a fairly um, growing East African community. And you know, we started talking about not using your cars, not driving, all those things. You know what they said? They said, we came to America so we could drive a car. And so the thing that we learned is we had to be talking about um, uh, transportation choices and making it so that it's easier, better, more efficient to use other al uh, alternatives to the auto, but we shouldn't be talking about why they shouldn't be driving their car. Um, some of the things that we learn with our different communities these days. So how are we achieving our values? And I'll go through some of these very quickly because I probably have too many slides, but again, environmental stewardship. Um, we tried to be a leader in terms of um, environmental um, sustainability and things. We've traveled, we've had groups of um, architects, um, engineers, landscape architects, developers, property owners, um, public officials who have gone abroad on many um, urban sustainability study tours and they've come back to um, help us understand the kinds of things that we can change in Seattle. And our former mayor was the one who actually started the mayor's uh, climate protection agreement that more than 1,000 mayors have signed at this point. So that's, those are some of the things that got us going, uh, really pushed us on sustainability. Economic opportunity, we're fortunate to have some major um, companies, organizations in Seattle, but we still have an issue of you know, kind of the higher skilled jobs and the higher paid jobs and then the really low service paying jobs and how do we get people moving up the, the ladder. We've been hit by the um, economic recession, of course, and so some of the things that we're doing and they're particularly in uh, some of our ethnic communities is how can we activate the space? How can we take those vacant storefronts and make them um, so they look better to help out the community. And we're doing things in terms of interim uses and, and um, art organizations going into storefronts and, and using the spaces. Um, building community is our third core value and then social equity is our fourth. And hopefully some of this is kind of going through what I'm, I'm saying very rapidly. Um, in terms of affordability of housing and so that people can live in the city and not have to live way out and then spend hours in their cars or, or such. Um, we try to look at increasing the density in our single family areas by allowing what we call backyard cottages. It took us 12 years to get the legislation through because it was controversial, but now it's, it's okay. Cottage development, where we can get, like the one on the upper right, um, it's a site for two, basically two and a half single family homes if you could do a half home. Uh, we got six cottages and three carriage units uh, by doing a demonstration ordinance and basically say we will kind of forgive the single family zoning and see what we could do to show people that we can increase densities even in single family zones without significantly changing the appearance. Um, Seattle is fortunate that its voters are um, generous and since 1981 we've passed um, five bond or levies for affordable housing. So we have a pretty good um, range of low income housing. We also have as part of our zoning um, started downtown but uh, it's moved out to our other areas. Anytime we increase the development potential, rezone an area, they contribute to um, primarily affordable housing but also pay toward open space, historic preservation, daycare, some of those things. So um, it's a, developers call it an ex extraction, we call it um, uh, incentive zoning or a bonus system. So as I said, we have the low end, we have the high end of housing. We're really working at trying to get that workforce now and, and doing some other uh, changes in our zoning so the other incentive zoning will work at the workforce level. In our commercial districts, 
Uh, again, if you remember the map, this is, these are our urban villages for the most part. Um, we eliminated residential density limits so that the developers could, um, weren't restricted by the zoning in terms of the number of units on a site. Um, we reduced and or eliminated parking requirements. If it was in a station area or an urban center, we eliminated parking requirements. Other areas, we reduced them because parking is a very significant cost, as you probably know. Um, we also improve the pedestrian orientation along the street fronts. Um, how can you create a better street front in terms of the way your store is designed, the um, transparency that's, uh, that's along the street front? Things that will make the pedestrian experience much better to encourage people to walk more. Um, downtown zoning, I mentioned, won't go into that. Um, the other thing that we're doing, uh, working closely with our transportation department, is implementing complete streets um, for all types of uses. Um, summer streets, closing down the streets. We don't call it closing streets. We call it opening it up for people. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to, how to convey these ideas without getting everybody uh, upset. We use the term road diets, and that really set the business people off when they felt that it was only for bicyclists as opposed to efficiency. Uh, we have a, um, a bicycle master plan. We've got a pedestrian ma uh, master plan. Um, again, trying to get more people to walk and ride uh, their bikes. We worked with the school district to implement the walking school bus, uh, trying to get the young kids to understand that you don't have to get in a car all the time to, to get to school. Planning for light rail. Uh, this is the south end of Seattle. It now goes from downtown down to the airport. And I mentioned that this is an area which had been, I think I mentioned it, uh, which had been redlined, had not had um, any new development, uh, market rate housing development since the mid 70s until rail came in. Um, it's an area that was you know, kind of forgotten by the developers. But this was an area also where the community I mentioned um, fought light rail. They didn't want it coming at the surface um, through their community. So when we tried to do station area planning down there and talk about how we can increase the densities and make town centers built around the station areas, they didn't want to talk to us because they were still trying to get light rail to not come through their community. Um, so we really struggled and we're only able to make a few changes um, in terms of the planning there. We are once again planning in southeast Seattle. The communities fortunately are working with us this time um, after a rocky start in 2009, but it's working much better now. Um, I mentioned the working with the uh, diverse communities. Um, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of staff resources, as well as some dollars to hire the people to do the simultaneous translation for us. But we are now getting people to come to the meeting who are renters, who are people of color, who have not in the past traditionally participated in the neighborhood planning process. So we think that's pretty successful. It's just kind of um, costly. Um, shrinking our streets, again, we don't call it road diets anymore, but we're looking at how to make it so it's better for bicycles, pedestrians. Uh, plus, we're building in natural drainage systems, so we're hitting upon the sustainable infrastructure part. This, these two pictures in the urban agriculture, these two pictures are uh, one of our HOPE 6 projects. So this is where we have our um, subsidized housing, but we also now have a mixed income area. It includes both rental and home ownership. It includes healthy um, housing units that we worked on with the University of Washington School of Nursing. Um, so it's a very mixed community that we're extremely proud about and very sustainable. Greening our city some more, um, whether it's pea patches in the city, whether it's uh, more green on the sidewalks, again, to encourage people to walk more. Um, this was a green factor as a um, concept. I won't go into explain it too much, but it's to provide more greenery than we used to require, but more flexibility in terms of the designer, and it's a concept that we borrowed from Berlin and um, Sweden. Restoring our waters, reducing our carbon footprint. That's it. Did I get through that fast enough? <laughs>